Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Rise. I'm Roddy Jones, and I have the honor and privilege to be joined by one of the few guys who's been able to play two sports, not just in high school, not just in college, but at the very highest level at professional sports. Played 15 years in Major League Baseball, played for the Atlanta Falcons as well. It's my pleasure to introduce and to talk with Brian Jordan today. Brian, how are you? It's the offseason. How's it going? Hey, Roddy. Hey, man. Thank you, man. Everything's going great. I'm just happy to be on the rise. And, you know, everything is, is everything. Uh, I continue to, to, to work hard, have fun with the kids. And uh, that's what it's all about in the offseason. What was it like growing up in the Jordan household as a youth? I'm assuming sports were a big part of it. But, but what was that dynamic like? Sports was definitely a part of it. Uh, my dad was was a great athlete. You know, of course, as a, as a kid, you want to be the best. Uh, I had an older brother and sister who were really good athletes. Uh, my sister probably being the best athlete in the family. Wow. Uh, I wanted to be better than them. You know, the little brother always following them around and, and wanting to compete. And, uh, you know, I know we'll get into it later, but I wrote my first children's book called I Told You I Can Play. It was about proving my brother <laughs> that I could play. He would never let me play with the older kids because he thought I'd get hurt. And I finally got my opportunity, and I proved all those guys wrong. Let, let's go to your high school career. You went to Milford Mill High School uh, in a great a great conference there in Baltimore where you played three sports, baseball, basketball, football. Uh, I, I, it was something that a lot of kids did in that day, but what was it like for you being able to not only play three sports but excel at all three? You know, going to Milford Mill as a freshman, and we had so many studs playing the game. I was a freshman, and I remember John Buckeyes, the head coach of the football team, he yelled my name to come in and at running back, and I'm sitting there. I'm all excited because, you know, I want to prove my brother and everybody that I can do this, but I wasn't afraid, and I think that opened the eyes of the yeah. coaches, you know. Uh, we've got some footage of you, Brian, in high school, some of those running back moves. Let's take, let's take a look at you your <laughs> junior year. I've had a sneak peek. And it is, I mean, this is wow. this is good stuff here. Look that at you're that doing, old Brian. school video. <laughs> oh, look at the moves. I, I like making a guy miss in the hole, trying to the guys gotta go low. <laughs> gotta go low, man. They could not take me head on, man. I was I was a lot bigger than most of those guys. <laughs> Yeah, a big number thirty-two piling in the end zone. I, you know, I, I feel like I feel like the wishbone at that time was made for a running back like you, a guy that had some had some nimbleness, and then you could sling I it could too. Sling it, look at it. <laughs> oh man, he got to catch that ball. Jeez, has to. It's got to help you out. I mean, you only get so many halfback passes, but again, piling in the end zone. Okay, so so this was a playoff run. You guys win. I believe this is the semifinals, yeah. but you guys were the underdog. In oh, that game, we were right? the underdogs, a big time. This was a really talented team we were playing against in Columbia, uh, Maryland. You know, getting to that next round though against Allegheny. Yeah, it's state championship game against Allegheny. We won't talk about the score of the game, but it was played <laughs> in the University of Maryland Stadium. Uh, your dream school. What was it like playing in that stadium? You know, it, it was so much fun. Uh, again, that, like you said, that was my dream school. Uh, I always wanted to play at Maryland, and I got my opportunity in the state championship, and I wanted to show Maryland that they made the right decision to give me that scholarship. And uh, I was going to play hard, play my best, and, uh, you know, hopefully walk away with a championship. But obviously that did not happen. Allegheny was just too powerful. Uh, we brought out 200 fans, and they brought their 8,000 fans to the game. So, <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> it was a little unfair on that. On that, it was such a huge school. Uh, they just had 100 players on that sideline. I mean, it was almost like we were playing a college. Wow. Uh, but, but, you know, but they the, I mean, you've got the full, the full display of talents in this highlight. I mean, we see you catch the ball, we see you running the ball. You did it all in this game, though. You know, I, I just wanted the ball. I wanted the opportunity, and uh, and my head coach John Buckeye said wanted to get me that ball uh, because I was hoping good things would happen if it did. And uh, I played a pretty good game, but you know, I wish we'd have won the won the state championship. Brian's college decision. How did he slip away from his home state school after this? And I remember that was the biggest decision of my life. Welcome back to The Rise with Brian Jordan. You decided to go to Richmond instead of the University yeah. of Maryland. 
uh, Maryland in the ACC. I mean, my dad grew up in the D.C. area. I know what Maryland means to that part of the country. What led you to that decision? I've read that there was some some miscommunication maybe <laughs> on whether or not you were going to be able to play both. Uh, I, maybe I'm characterizing it very nicely, but what led you to the extremely tough decision to pass up the ACC, the big time, the exposure that you were talking about at Maryland to go to the University of Richmond? One guy that I loved the most was Lim Bias. And I would, Merlin was recruiting me as a junior. And all I said was, offer me a scholarship. I'm going to Maryland. I'm not going to take any more trips. And I would go out and watch Lim Bias. And uh, I mean, I was just pumped up. He was one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. And I wanted to be, you know, that athletic, that explosive like he was. Just when I'm ready to sign a dotted line, all of a sudden he tells me I cannot play baseball my freshman year. I had to focus oh. on football. And I remember that was the biggest decision of my life. And I looked back at my parents and I said, I can't sit out a season of baseball. And you know what? I decided to leave Maryland and, and go to University of Richmond where I could do both and continue on living my dreams. In high school, you're a three-sport athlete. At Richmond, you're a two-sport athlete, but now having to deal with the college version of baseball and football. Uh, what was that transition like for you, going from three sports to two sports, high school to college? Well, all I know is if they had to transfer a portal uh, my freshman year, I, I would have been thinking about it hard because, you know, not going to oh. Maryland and then going to a Division One double A school like Richmond, you know, you expect to come in and be starting. And a defensive wow. back coach called me over to defense and said, hey, you know, you got a chance to, to play a lot over here on defense. So I just wanted to be on the field. And as long as I could touch the ball, return punts, return kicks, and play defense, I was good. I'm like, hey, let's let's make it happen. Uh, but my head coach, Dal Shealy, had different plans. You know, he wanted to redshirt me. And I, that didn't sit well with me at all. Uh, I did show patience early and, uh, you know, good things happened from there. I was fortunate enough to go to a Division One AA school and get invited to the Senior Bowl, which really put me on the map. And I was supposed to be the first or second safety taken in that draft until in the Senior Bowl first quarter, I broke my leg, dislocated my ankle. You know, I'm a believer. And uh, at the end of the day, I worked my butt back to where I, I you know, started three years for the Falcons. So, so when you went to the Senior Bowl, you had already been drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals, correct? So your professional baseball career had begun. I mean, that, that had to be tough mentally for you thinking, am I going to play professionally in either sport at that point, right? Right. It, it was a tough decision. Uh, my junior year, uh, we actually played against the Richmond Braves, Triple A team. And I'm talking about the Dave Justice, the Ron Gantz, uh, the Mark <laughs> All Lippen, the guys that you ended up playing with and against later on. Right, against. And, uh, you know, they were one step away from the big leagues. And I remember facing their top prospect pitcher, Derek Lilliquist, at the time. And I almost hit for the cycle against those guys. And I was saying, man, if they're one step away, huh, maybe I can play Major League Baseball. And I remember right after that game, uh, St. Louis Cardinal scout came to me and said, hey, we want to draft you first round. You were at a time where, where they were allowing, because you look at like Kyler Murray more recently, and, and, right. and the A's allowed him to do it as well, and he never goes and sees the, the field for, for the A's, so it's fascinating the way this stuff works out. But but you, you go and you get drafted by the Falcons, you you make the, the Atlanta Falcons. Well, I, got you... by Buffalo, I got drafted by Buffalo I got drafted by Buffalo. Excuse me, Bills. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, then, and then they cut you, right, and then you go into the Falcons, correct? Yeah, it was an interesting story, man. I, I, you know, Buffalo, that was that was the years Buffalo was on top. And I led the defensive backs and tackles in that training camp. And the trainer said, Marv Levy wants to see you in his office. And I'm saying, okay, awesome. You know, to congratulate me for making the team, this is going to be great. And he looked at me and was like, Brian, you know, we really, we were impressed with you. Uh, but you're the 46 man on a 45 man roster. <laughs> it oh, just broke my wow. heart. And you know, before I even left the parking lot, my agent called me and said, uh, "Atlanta Falcons want you to fly to Atlanta, take a physical." And that's when I became Atlanta Falcon. And uh, you know, I was there with Prime Time, my good friend yeah. Dion. So 
-hmm. you know that was that was a blessing in its own to, to come to Atlanta and, and help rebuild the team because uh, they were terrible when I first got there. Yeah, you don't have to remind me of those days. <laughs> <laughs> As a guy who's born and raised in Atlanta, uh, I, 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 you mentioned playing with Prime Time, a guy who played both sports. What was it like to be in a locker room, not only with a guy of that personality, but a guy who was doing what you were doing as well, playing both baseball and football? Dion was probably one of my favorite teammates of all time because wow. he was a guy that goes out there and make you better. And, you know, he was already great. He wanted you to get to that level. I mean, he had all the speed and quickness in the world, but he was a smart football player. And, you know, we were learning. I was learning from him uh, how to get better. And uh, my third year, I was an alternate in the Pro Bowl. So I was starting to really take off. And Glanville came in and really turned the Falcons around. I mean, we were, we were on an upward swing. And unfortunately, uh, after my third year, I, I talked to Glanville and those guys, and I said, you better sign me because I know the Cardinals are coming. <laughs> and they, they dragged their feet, and the Cardinals offered me a, a guaranteed deal that I couldn't pass up, you know, after playing three years in the NFL. And, you know, heck, I led the team in tackles one year. So, you know, yeah. you can imagine what I was putting my body through. So yeah. baseball came calling, and I had to, you know, give it a fair shot. Brian's rise to be a major league all-star next. Well, you know, you go from one pressure cook situation hitting behind Mark McGuire to another one because I had to hit behind Chipper Jones. Welcome back to The Rise with Brian Jordan. In April of 1992, you make your major league debut. Take me back to that day when you when you stepped on a, on a big league field for the first time in the majors with the bright lights. What was that like? Roddy, it was so unexpected, man, because... Uh, here really? it is. I'm leaving spring training. I played double A the year before. And Ted Simmons uh, was the general manager for the Cardinals. And I'm sitting there. I am not going back to double A. Send me to triple A. And we're going back and forth. And then finally, Ted Simmons said, I'm going to send you to triple A. And if you hit under 100 the first week of the season, I'm sending you all the way to A ball. <laughs> so <laughs> here it is. I leave spring training. I'm on my way to Louisville, Kentucky. I stop in Atlanta to see my family, and I get a call from Ted Simmons saying, hey, you're on a plane in the morning to St. Louis, because Andre Scalawaga, the for opening day, breaks his Big wrist. Big Cat. Big Cat breaks his wrist. I had a great night, man. I was uh, two for five, uh, I think, and drove in four runs, and I'm sitting there like, man, this game is easy. <laughs> so, yeah, it was totally unexpected, but it was a day I will never, ever forget. The 1995 season, you, you play 131 games, have an incredible year. You continue in 96. You got hurt a little bit in 97, but 98 was a fantastic season for you. And, and it's also a season that they point to the summer that, quote unquote, saved baseball. And a lot of it was because of your St. Louis Cardinals team and what Mark McGuire was doing. Not many people talk about how well you played hitting behind him to help give <laughs> Mark that opportunity. You know, it was an incredible season. And for me, it was probably the most pressure I had as a hitter to wow. be able to perform behind one of the greatest home run hitters in the game uh, and Mark McGuire. And, and it was just an incredible year to bring baseball back on the map. Uh, two great guys and Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa going at it. What was the circus like around it? Because, I mean, you guys oh, became my. a spectacle around the country. <laughs> when I tell you I hated batting practice because Mark McGuire would fill the stadium for batting practice, and I had to hit behind him. So they're cheering for Mark McGuire. As soon as I walk in there, they're booing me because I'm in the, in the batting <laughs> case. Well, well, after that 98 season, you go to the Braves where you have a great season in 1999. You guys make it to the World Series. We won't necessarily talk about the result. I mean, I'm a... Uh, like I said, born and raised yeah. in Atlanta. <laughs> but, but what was what was what was that journey of the World Series like? And you go from the, the the home run chase of '98 and the spectacle around it to really one of the best teams, if not the best team in baseball, for most of the year in 1999. Uh, what was that '99 run to the World Series like? Well, you know, you go from one pressure cook situation hitting behind Mark <laughs> McGuire to another one because I had to hit behind Chipper Joe. So, right, right. you know. <laughs> Now you, you, you got to step up your game again and perform uh, because Chipper's one of the greatest hitters I ever played with, played behind, 
and just a fun year to learn and continue to get better. We had a phenomenal year, but it ended uh, losing to the Yankees. But that's what you fight for as a Major League Baseball yeah. player, to get to that, that stage and to have the opportunity to experience that stage is something I would never forget. You're, you're a Braves legend. You, you did that in, in, uh, in 99. Your Braves career ended shortly thereafter, but you came back to finish your career with the Braves when you had guys, I'm assuming, in that in that clubhouse, guys like Jeff Francoeur that are looking up and saying, wow, I get to play with Brian Jordan. Can you believe it? So what, what was it like to come back to the Atlanta Braves as a quote-unquote elder statesman when you are mentoring some of the young players, be back with the organization that you're now such a big part of, what was that return? Um, what was it like and what did it mean to you? Well, it, it meant a lot because I, I never wanted to leave Atlanta. And, yeah. you know, I got, you know, I signed a free agent deal, five-year deal to play in Atlanta. And after three years, very successful years, by the way, I was in the trade to L.A. Wow. And, uh you know, I never thought I would ever be traded. And, but you understand quickly the business of, of baseball, the business of football. You know, it's out of your control. And I remember going to the Dodgers, and I really wanted to prove that move wrong. And I had the worst first month of my career in L.A. Imagine, Roddy, you, you get announced in the start lineup at home and you run out to your position and everybody booing you at home. That's the I, way it I was. Know, I, know. I mean, in that Derek first was one of the most popular L players in that organization at the time, so I can only imagine <laughs> what that was like. Yeah, but I turned my season around real quick and uh, they, they yeah. learned to love me real quick out in L.A., but it, it was a terrible start. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, everywhere you go, everybody loves you. I will say... As a, as a fan at the time, I don't know if you paid attention to the fan sentiment, but there was a lot of there was a lot of people that didn't like that move because you were so beloved here in Atlanta. And certainly when you came back, uh, certainly when you came back, everybody everybody embraced it. And it was really cool that that, that you were brought back. So yeah, uh, no, it, it was fun being brought back, and and then you know getting it. Brian McCann, Jeff Francoeur, two homegrown yeah. Georgia boys, they get the call up to the big leagues and. And kind of being a leader and mentor with Jeff, uh, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, you pass the baton over to a younger guy and you, you try to show him the right way. And uh, that's what I was able to do. And uh, thankful that John Sherholz came and brought me back to Atlanta. More Rise with one of the few multi-sport athletes of a generation after this. Welcome back to The Rise with Brian Jordan. Last year, 2021, you were voted into your fourth state Hall of Fame going into the Georgia Hall of Fame. Uh, what, is, what is it like to be honored by that many states and to have that many, that many municipalities uh, recognize the accomplishments that you've had over the course of your career? You know, it's a blessing and it's something that I really didn't expect. You know, being from Baltimore, Maryland, yeah, going into Maryland Hall of Fame was just awesome. You know, going back home and, and being recognized uh, back in, in Baltimore and Maryland, it was, it was phenomenal. I didn't expect the Missouri playing in St. Louis for a long time. And, you know, I was just waiting for Georgia and hoping and hoping that I would, <laughs> you know, finally make it into the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame, which I did. And uh, what a great celebration. And, uh, again, I'm just truly blessed. And I'm just happy that, you know, people recognize some of my accomplishments. I want to talk to you about, about what you've done since, uh, starting with the broadcasting stuff. Did you always know that you wanted to get into the media? And did you always envision that being with the Braves? Absolutely not, Roddy. That was the, that was the least thing on my mind, being a broadcaster. <laughs> uh, and I quickly learned it's just talking about your experience, what you see out yeah. there, and have fun with it. And you know, after, what is it, 13 years, 14 years of, of being now with Bally Sports and calling some ACC football games, the ACC Network, yeah. I mean, it's, it's fun. I, I love to do it, and, uh, you know, I'm loving the fact that I get the opportunity to call some football games because that's the one near and dear to my heart. All right, Brian, so so you're obviously doing the broadcasting thing, but, but I want to ask you about something that we talked about earlier, and that's your children's books. I mean, you mentioned I Told You I Can Play. Mm -hmm. You also have Time Out for Bullies. You've got a few others. What made you want to get into writing children's books? Well, it, it, it's a gift from God, I'm going to be honest, because I never, ever thought I would be the one writing children's books because I was that kid <laughs> growing up 
I had no confidence in reading. I was that kid wow. who tried to play sick, put the head down when the teacher's going around saying, who wants to read next? I was embarrassed and I didn't want to do it. I, I love going to schools uh, and telling kids my story. And when I tell them my story, uh, I asked them at the end, who in here is like me? Had no confidence in reading and to see the hands go up, you know, I was fortunate enough to start a reading challenge down in Douglas County where we looked at all third graders. It's really worked out, it's been successful. AR testing scores have gone up. Kids are really trying now. So it's a program that I wanna take, not just here in Georgia, but around the world. And uh, you know, we, we gotta get to these kids early. You know, although technology is taking over, you know, everybody has to learn how to read. The fundamentals are so important. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, heck, going on Twitter and scrolling through—that's that's reading. You gotta be able, <laughs> that's right. You gotta be able to do that. Um, uh, so, last thing I want to ask you about your foundation and what you all are doing. Not only, obviously, you you talked about the work with with reading at the at the youth level, but you're also doing things with college scholarships. Correct? What are you guys doing there? Yeah, I started my foundation in 1998, and, and again. I learned from my mom, you know, she taught kids with special needs and to see her poor heart and soul and to, to giving these kids hope. I knew I wanted to do that if I ever make it, you know, reach my dreams. So I started the foundation in 1998, giving scholarships to those kids who are deserving, but, you know, single parent homes or family that's not making more than 50,000 that really can't afford their kids to go to college. So this past year we gave out 35 scholarships and what we do is we go and give them out in front of the Braves fans before a game and uh, see the smiles on those kids' face to know that you're making an impact and, and then to watch these kids excel, it's, it's, it's worth it. Uh, I'm so thankful that I was fortunate enough to, to have a foundation to be able to do that. And so wow. we just continue to give, 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 and that's, that's the most important thing about it, to, to change these oh. kids' lives. That's that's incredible work, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for someone like you who's impacted so many lives on the field, uh, me being one of them. I mean, I was a, I was a ten year old in nineteen ninety nine watching that team. You were one of my favorite players, and and then seeing what you've been able to do in the community in Atlanta after that, it's just been incredible, Brian. So so obviously keep up the great work, and I appreciate you joining us. A guy that played fifteen years in Major League Baseball, played professionally for the Atlanta Falcons as well. Obviously, a great career that you've had in broadcasting since and the work that you've done. Brian, it's been a real pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thanks, Rodney. I really appreciate it, man. Enjoyed it. Be sure to check in for more Rise shows, original programming, and memorable games on Origin Sports. I'm Roddy Jones. Thanks for joining us.